Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. So in today's episode, ladies, you are in for a real treat. Uh, we have Gwen Aspen. She's the president and founder or co-founder of Adequim, which is a property management company that pretty much hires and sources remote workers, close to 260 employees she has on her team, and she deploys them to her clients, which are property management companies. So there's a lot of companies out there doing that in these, you know, in these days. What I really loved about our interview with her, she's so humble, um, she's so authentic and very, very successful. And she was really great to give us some specific insight around navigating, you know you need support, you know you might need a VA, but how do you work on the business and in it at the same time? And I think for a lot of small business owners, that can get very overwhelming. We go into some really specifics on how to do that and do it successfully. Absolutely. And if you are looking to scale and to do things more efficient, you're having this conversation about how to create standard operating procedures. And Gwen, she was very specific about how you, in your real estate business, you can get started. Sometimes we have too many tasks and we don't know where to get started and what are the next steps. So she gives very specifics on how you can get started creating your own SOPs. This is so, so, so good. We probably need to have her back pretty soon, but this is a great start for you that are looking to scale and create standard procedures for your company. Investors, as we all know, financing deals in today's market can be a bit challenging at times. If you're looking at funding your next real estate transaction, we are so excited to introduce to you Fund That Flip. Fund that Flip is a lending partner dedicated to grow your real estate investment portfolio. They specialize in fix and flip, buy and hold, new construction, and cash out refi for one to four units. Ladies, we have known the founder, Matt, and his team for many years now, and we can assure you that their support goes beyond just lending money. They become a true partner. So if you're looking for great terms and reliable service, check out fundaflip.com slash investher. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investor Show, where we are on a very, very big mission to support women in living a financially free and balanced life through real estate investing and whatever other investing we eventually get into. But the focus right now is, is real estate. So um, we have Gwen Aspen uh, from Homa, Omaha, Nebraska on our show today. So welcome, Gwen. We're, we're so lucky to have you. Oh my gosh. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're really looking forward uh, to getting into her story and, and just really interesting things she's up to with her company in property management. So we'll get, we'll get to that. Stay tuned. Uh, before we go there, as we always like to do, kind of get connected to all the amazing women listening uh, across the globe. And our listenership is going up, which is, which is just amazing. And we just thank you all with, for listening. And if you do like our show, we really super would appreciate if you go over, over to iTunes and just leave us a, a review. You know, I think we're up to what, 149, I think. So it'd be great to get over the 150 mark. But please leave us a review, subscribe, what have you. That'd be a really helpful for us as we continue to build our message and serving more women. Uh, so I think it's my turn to share a little tidbit, right, Andre? It is. Okay. What's going on with you? So, so I got a call. Every time I get a call from the school, my son's oh, a kindergartner. God. The phone, the phone comes up and I have them programmed in my phone, like the school, you know, so it says lower elementary school. And I'm like, my heart drops, right? Every time I get the call, because I have gotten about three calls and, and some of them have been my son putting food down another kid's shirt. Um, another one has oh. been, another one has been, you know, uh, my son being a little too silly. So this call comes in, I'm like, oh no, Jesus, you know? So I look and hello, hi, this is Miss, Miss so-and-so, his teacher. I'm like, hi. Um, I'm like, oh, how you doing? You know, I'm like, and uh, she goes, listen, I just want to give you a heads up on something. I'm like, oh, Jesus. She goes, um, report cards are coming out. I'm like, I, I didn't even know kindergartners get report cards, but okay, awesome. I didn't say yes. this, but in my head, I'm like, wow, that's intense. But um, she's like, report cards are coming out and he's doing amazingly well at everything except for reading. And um, I'd love to, it's not like low, but it's not like 
there's a benchmark and he didn't meet the benchmark. So, so I was like, oh, it's interesting, you know? So I met with her the other day and I met with her just to give, get some tools. And you know, it's funny. She's like, you don't need to come in. Um, and I was like, should I go in? Should I not go in? I've been working with him on reading, but I went in there and I have a point to why I'm telling you the story, but just stay with me. I went in there and I said, this is what I'm doing right now. I know how to read. Do I need a, Do I know how to teach a six-year-old how to read? I don't know if I know those techniques. So she gave me some great techniques about, you know, um, pronouncing the word in, in consonants. You should clap, right? Like Valentine. I'm like, I didn't know that. I thought you just say, just say the word. I mean, these are like, maybe <laughs> I'm just a moron, but she gave me these tools and she said, you should clap. I said, okay, great. She said, do you have him read to your daughter? Cause I have a three-year-old great idea. Like the really simple book. Um, I said, oh, I give him three books to read a day. And she's like, that's a little intense. You might want to just do one. That's also helpful, right? So I left there with like six strategies, right? To, to really, to do, and I felt empowered. I felt good about it. I say that because it just reminded me about how important it is to get strategies. When something isn't working, you know, we often think we should just know what to do, right? I could have just said, I know how to read, you know, I'm 40, almost 42 years old. I know how to read. I can teach my kid to read. I don't need to go in and see a teacher. But I asked myself, do I know the strategies that work for a six-year-old? I really don't. You know, this is my first kid. I'm not a teacher. Thank God. I'm not a teacher. And I'm like, you know, I need some strategies. So I think we all can do that more in our lives. And then I started thinking about my life and I'm like, oh, I can really use that in this area or this area. Just, you know, if something isn't working for you, or if there's some, don't do it alone. And there are strategies out there, you know, just seek them and then employ them and then use them. And I'm going to start to use these strategies with my son. Am I worried about his reading? Not really. Uh, I know he'll get it, you know, and he's, but I, I needed some better tools. So I felt more equipped. I think we all can use that in our, in, in different areas of our lives. So I just want to mention that quick little. Definitely. Story. And I think that in real estate is the same thing, right? Yeah. We, we don't know what we don't know. So until it's like right in front of our face, it's like, ah. Or, or you're struggling or, or, or something. I think that we are not used to ask for help and that might be seen as a weakness. Yeah. Um, for me, I cannot afford to do not ask for help. That is different. The impact of me not asking for help is, it goes across the board. It will delay my development. It will affect my partnerships. And um, the longer I do try to resolve by myself, it will be, you know, longer that I will reach my goals. So yeah. I'm just like, I'm asking for help all over the place. That doesn't yeah. mean that, oh, I'm not capable of implementing things or executing things because we as women, we know that we, <laughs> we kind of execute a lot of things at the same time. But at this, thinking about it, uh, the life that we want to live, uh, the legacy that we want to you know, live to our children and for all the next generations across the board, it goes from kindergarten strategies to syndicating multifamilies into whatever you might call is this is the same strategy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very cool. So, so a quick little lesson. If you don't know how to pronounce Valentine's, just do it three times and clap your hands too. So, um, so Gwen, without further ado, we're just so pleased to have you on. I love what you're up to with your company. Um, we always like to ask the women we interview, the amazing women we interview, what propelled you to get involved in real estate? And I know your, your specialty is property management, but I know you're involved in a lot of different things. So what propelled you to get involved in the, the business? Well, when I was uh, younger, I really... I was just kind of one of those restless young people that really didn't have a direction or know what to do. And just to go with what you were talking about, I just started reading books uh, about money and investing. And uh, my husband and I decided to just live a very simple life. We lived in a, a studio apartment in Kansas City where the bed actually was a drawer. <laughs> And it like, you just, instead of making your bed, you would just push it underneath the kitchen. And we just lived like that. And we both had corporate jobs and we just were like uh, saving and saving and saving money and investing in rental properties. So I ended up buying my first uh, 11 unit complex with him uh, when I was like 22 years old. And so we bought that instead of like a house to live in, just lived in the little studio apartment. And, uh, and so that's kind of how we got started. We just were reading and learning and talking to people. 
And um, I'm from Detroit and I bought that 11 unit complex in the back of a pickup truck because I now live in Nebraska, which is like a totally like the biggest cultural shocker in the world. <laughs> like, does this really happen? Oh my God. But yeah, it really happened in the back of a p- pickup truck. So that was kind of how we started in the industry. Wow. So, <laughs> so looking back at that first deal, right? What we what you wish, knowing what you know now, right? What you wish you knew back then? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So many things. But, um, you know, it took us a long time uh, to, well, two things. Just one would be processes and procedures. And my husband actually had a better feel for that than I did uh, at the time. But the very first thing, when we started managing properties, we had these jobs that were, were very intense uh, at the time. Uh, we got to like, uh, I think 18 units and we just couldn't handle our two super hardcore corporate jobs and the 18 units. Um, and so that's kind of when we decided we didn't really like corporate America and maybe we should become a property management company and we could use um, the technology that we had learned in our respective corporate jobs and put it into the property management industry, which at the time was somewhat unique. Now everybody's using technology and property management, but we just thought of ourselves as we could be more tech savvy than ever, than others in the area. And we would um, be very, we would have integrity. But so that was the, the thing, uh, but I didn't really realize how much if I had just written the processes and procedures down at the front end and held everybody accountable um, that would have, and the accountability was a huge thing, just coming up with like a meeting strategy where we have standing meetings and we write everything down and hold everyone accountable, how much that would have moved us and propelled us forward faster. You know, though, I always hear, right, when I'm talking to people, I say, yeah, standard operating procedures that you go and you go like, okay, go here, go here, make a left, go straight, or click this button, where? on the top left corner or you very specific and people say, geez, this is so much time consuming and details and this is annoying. And I always say, you cannot afford to do not do it. Oh my God. You will the, absolutely takes a lot of effort to put all of those procedures and, and standard operating, you know, processes in place. But you do it once and you adjust as you go. Because as you're saying, it, it delays if you don't do it right now. Yes. Isn't it? And it, if people need an emotional thing to propel them forward, um, one of the things where I really it hit home, like I need operating procedures, is you get an employee and you're like, it's not working out. And they end up like running you. And I I had this employee and she was so mean to me. I would come into the office and it'd be like, hey, I won't say what her name is. Hey, what's up? Good morning. And she would like, just not even talk to me. She wouldn't even say hello. (laughs) And I was like, I can't believe I'm coming to my own company and my employee won't even say anything to me. And I'm at her mercy because I don't have any processes and procedures and I'm afraid of losing her because there's no documentation. I mean, that's a rookie mistake, but that emotional moment, whenever I didn't want to write the procedures and I didn't want to spend five hours on a Sunday, like making screenshots with little red, um, you know, arrows going Mm -hmm. to right here, this button. I was like, remember that moment when your, your employee, like managed you never go back to that again. And so that's kind of what processes and procedures do. It helps you have ownership over your company and you're not at the mercy of anyone that works for you. I think that's so important. And I think most of the women listening, if you pull them, you know, how important are processes and procedures? Like, you know, most people would say they're, they're really important. And I know, and Jess and I are building them right now for our, you know, for our entity here with the investor, um, which I've been, I'm just, I said, I've been doing a really good job. So if that's yes. helpful, she gives me positive encouragement <laughs> because it's not my forte, but I actually really appreciate them. And I've come to really appreciate them over the years. And, and I've learned the hard way like you, Gwen, what happens when you don't right, have that. But you got someone who's listening to this. And I think this is a common profile. I understand how important it is. I value it, but I'm working in the business. 
right? Yeah. And, and oh. I have to work on the business, right? So there's always a timing of like when you should do these things and when it's easier to do those things. But now you're in it, right? You might have a multifamily, you have this, you have that. And then you're like stepping back and go, shit, you know, I really need to have processes and procedures or, or now I'm ready for that VA or that administrative assistant or that number two. Wow. What do I need to create now? And then where do I carve the time to do that? Cause I'm still, they're still calling me, right? The tenants, the, the, the loan officer, the banker, my attorneys got something to ask me. So I think that's the rub for a lot of people, especially women oh, that sure. are in our community, right? They get it. I see how important it is. How do they create the carving out the time, the energy, the focus? Like, is there a checklist, right? I need to create a communication um, strategy, right? I need to create a document management strategy, right? We're all going into the same place. You're going to Google Drive. So-and-so is going to Dropbox. I created a Google Drive. You I mean, that happens. My husband and I created <laughs> two folders the other day. I created a Dropbox folder. He created a Google Drive folder, but the same project. Oh, God. I mean, that's not good, right? Obviously. That's a whole other story. I need like counseling, but, but seriously, the, the key here is how do you, what would you say to the woman listening to navigate that? Because it's a, it's a, it is a challenge. Not so much like I need to do it, but how do I do it in the midst of me being in it? You know? Oh, oh yeah. No, I, I totally get it. And we've started several companies. So we've always had that been in that place where it's like, I don't have enough money to hire somebody. I don't think, uh, or maybe I do, but it's like a leap of faith. And it is really, it is really difficult. So I think the first thing is know yourself. What are you good at? Some people are not projects people. So if you're not a projects person and you are never going to get those processes and procedures done, like if it's been on your list for six months and you've made literally no progress on it, then that's a sign that that's not going to happen for you. So you're going to have to find another person to do those processes and procedures. If you just don't want to answer the phone, because we do, one of our companies, we do source remote labor from Mexico for property management companies. So a lot of the times it's a, a one woman show or one man show and the first employee ends up being a remote assistant from Mexico. And a lot of the times they'll just call me and say, I'm just so overwhelmed. I just need someone to pick up the phone because mm. they can't do the deep work of creating the processes and procedures when they're interrupted every 10 minutes. So I think the first step is really just deciding what you want your work life to look like, what you're really successful and good at, and then taking the things that you're not as good at and outsourcing them. And it can change over time. I mean, first we, we got people to take the phone calls, but now I'm at a place where I really had to hire someone for projects. And so I have a remote assistant doing projects for me now. And so, and I like projects and I'm good at projects. I just wasn't able to get them all finished. And I had to tell myself like, look, you need help with this. Uh, but when you hire a projects person, honestly, touching base, having like a huddle, like a 10 minute meeting in the morning, just to ensure that they know what they're doing that day. And you don't waste their whole day with them going down a rabbit hole or the wrong direction. Or like you said, like maybe they make it all in sweet process and you wanted it in drive having a 10 minute meeting at the beginning with a goal for the day and like a 10 minute meeting at, in, at the, in the evening, will make sure that you're getting your money's worth with a projects person, in my opinion. Well, and, and when we still, still the carving time, right? So I, I went to a um, seminar a couple of years ago and they said, okay, make a list of all this stuff that you do. Well, if I start making a list of everything that I do, it's just going to go nuts. So when somebody's creating standard operating procedures, what they should focus on, because if we get so overwhelmed about every single item, mm -hmm. it just paralyzed, right? And so my, my number one question is, what will be the, like, where do I get started? And number sure. two is like, I saw this, delegate, um, eliminate, or automate. Do you have any other column that I should add to, to that list? Why am I going through this process? Well, starting with your first question. So most people, it, because we're so distracted, I mean, there's a lot of research going into distractions will 
basically suck your energy and suck your productivity. So like I said, most people want someone to take the phone calls first, but how do you train that person? So I always ask people to create an FAQs. What are, give me 25 of the most common questions that people call and ask. And then how do they find that information on their own? So the goal is not that somebody just takes the call and transfers it to you. It's that they can actually solve 80% of the questions that come in on their own. So that's the first document. If someone just is overwhelmed and they don't even know where to start that I ask people to begin with is that document that can give you the space, the, the time to not be distracted and work on areas that are of concern. So, I mean, with automation, I'm on a software that can automate so many things and it can get incredibly overwhelming. I will say having signable documents is a game changer. Number one, <laughs> because is. people in your office, I was just talking to someone yesterday and someone translated something into Spanish and it was like a mess and sent it off to somebody. It was a five day notice and it ended up being an absolute disaster. And then he spent the rest of the day digging himself out of the pit that he had just been dug into. And so I was like, if you just had standard documents, then it's a right click for that person and you won't spend that time digging yourself out. So when I'm asking people to like think, I mean, sign up all documents is mine, but someone else, I mean, the process would be, what do I, what am I always cleaning up after other people? And how do I prevent myself from doing that? Um, and, and like, if I, what is the root cause of the problem? And if you go to the root cause, then you'll give yourself way more time than you even thought you could by focusing on something silly or automating something small in the system. Does that make sense? I mean, and when it comes to VAs, which I know, you know, the uniqueness of what you guys are up to is that you outsource, right? VAs yes. to, to, to property management companies. You probably started with your own company to, to do that, I would imagine. Absolutely. Right? Everything that we've developed is because we needed it for our own companies. So yeah, yeah it's, and it all has been super organic that way. And I think VAs, you know, it, it's interesting because I've gotten a discussion the other day with someone, um, do I hire a VA first? Do I, um, do I bring somebody into my office first? You know, how important it, you know, what, what, where does the VA shine and where does someone who's like a, you know, come to my office and roll up the sleeves kind of person shine? What have you seen? And I know there's no blanket statement, but as, as, as women listening to this, they, they're growing their team, they're growing their, you know, they're, they're writing down, really getting better or having someone help them write down their processes and, and what have you. And they know they, they need to make a hiring decision. They need to grow and they need to get rid of the less valuable tasks they're doing and get on to the, to the higher money making time things. How did they, na like, how did you begin navigating that? You know, you obviously went out and got and sourced your own VAs and now you're doing that for other property management companies. Regardless of what the company is, how did you sort, how did you kind of navigate the, what's the right person for this task? Did you first make the task list and say, okay, they're remote. So that can they do X, Y, and Z? Or is it like anyone can do a VA can do anything? Like, I'm curious what you are like, oh, that's a little beyond a VA. Like, how did you navigate that? Um, because some people might say, well, you need a team to come into the office and, you know, you need to huddle all together and be together. I mean, you could hear different things. So I'm curious, how did you figure that out? Well, ours actually, the way that we started it at this was friendship. My husband had a friend in Mexico in 2008 when the economy was bad here. Mm. It was even worse in Mexico. And she called him and said, I just had a baby. I'm having trouble feeding my family. Can I have, I mean, is there anything I can do for you for a job? So that's how we started. It just started out of friendship. It worked great. And then we hired all her friends. But now in 2020, I would say the way to think about remote labor, because um, countries like Mexico, the education system is really good. And these are really highly educated people who have fabulous English skills in many cases. Um, Anything that can be done from behind a computer can be outsourced. Um, there are two areas where I would say that's not true. One is uh, we still have a policy at our property management company and all of our companies that if you're dealing with money, 
uh, or credit card, taking credit cards or anything financial, you have to be in the office. Uh, any software system that you'd be using, any of the big four property management softwares have a privileges function. So you can just limit what people can see who are not in the office. And this isn't just if you're going uh, abroad, but even if you have a work from home workforce, I would say that those two functions need to be done in the office. Uh, however, um, anything else really could be outsourced. Now you have to really know yourself when you're going to outsource work. First of all, are you gonna be able to build a relationship over webcam, phone, instant message? And how are you going to nurture that relationship? And when things go wrong, because they do with any employee that you have, are you gonna be able to reach out and have a real conversation that's not in person and get everybody back on track. And I do think that if, if that's not you, there are ways to outsource just tasks where you don't like know anybody and it's just like tasks, like you just outsource the applications and you outsource it to a company and it's not personal. But if you're gonna have like a, someone who you work with every day, eight hours a day, you have to know yourself well enough to know if you can manage this relationship because uh, it is totally relationship-based, even if they're in another country. And that, that's where people, they call it soft skills, but it's really like the main skills are getting along with people, inspiring people and holding people accountable and being able to manage the workflow over webcam. Wow, that is, that is very specific. And this is the first time that I heard from that perspective that everything that is behind a computer except those those two things that you mentioned can be um outsourced from from like a, you mentioned the the money part and how do you deal with the data the information from tenants that or or even for like in syndication deals though there's Restors, like yeah. really private information um do you guys nav how do you guys navigate that? Well, the privileges function is really the real deal. If no one can see more than the last four digits of a social security number or has any access to a credit card information or banking information, I mean, they really can't get, I've never, after doing this since 2008, we haven't had any issues, but you really have to understand the privileges function of your computer system and and take it very very seriously um, and so if you do so you can manage so much from uh, VAs from another country and I mean there is a you also want good insurance too because in Mexico people are always like can you do a background check and I'm like well not really like everyone in the cartel has a clean background in Mexico. So it's not like you can do like some amazing background check. You just have to make sure that you cover yourself with what they can see and what they have access to. But a lot of the things that we do hit, um, we get nervous about those pieces of information. If you obscure those, they can handle work orders and talking to vendors and uh, talking to the, the residents about any of their problems and tell them what what they owe and you know they, they can do so much of the day-to-day -day work um, without having access to that so that's kind of going through a, a system like a rent manager app folio and mm -hmm. on the property management side um there's times like so if you you hire a va for your for your company and you're like i gotta start sharing folders with them right maybe you're doing it through google drive or mm -hmm. you know dropbox what have you um, G Suite. I mean, I mean, I know, you know, we have a whole G Suite as well in our, some, one of our businesses. Um, do you find that people when they're doing it on their own should go down one path, you know, put, from a security perspective, from a, like a, you know, privileges perspective? Because some of it's like, you can just, I've heard horror stories, people going into like, you know, getting Google Drive, getting their, their, their folders shared and they download everything and they're gone. And meanwhile, it's all really important. So I don't know, I'm curious how you've seen that when it goes beyond the software, the privileged software, like a, like a system, like you're mentioning, it's really just on your own, right? You know, I, maybe I've just been lucky, but we have like 260 remote assistants mm -hmm. now, and we've had several over the years. Uh, nobody, we haven't had that issue before. Um, there was one, 
I, I mean, it, we are scared and I think there should be a healthy fear. I just read a book um, by Tiffany Couch called The Thief in Your Company. Mm. Um, and sounds scary. It's, it was awesome, actually. It was a super easy read. Unfortunately, it's not on Audible, but it, it's totally worth the, the investment in, in reading a book. But the main ways that people can contribute to fraud is being in the office and getting the mail is really the biggest concern. Hmm. Um, additionally, you have to always make sure that your vendors, like you're always looking at your vendors and people can't create vendors without you knowing who's mm -hmm. getting paid. That's another way that people commit fraud. Hmm. And then the other way was just, if you have a really large organization, uh, putting like a fake employee in who gets paid uh, in a fake way. Wow. Those were the main ways that people committed fraud. Interesting. Uh, it was, and they were not found through audits. They were found through whistleblowing. So I think the main thing with safety of your company and ensuring that um, you do not have anyone stealing from you, which is essentially the root fear is that mm -hmm. someone's going to steal money from yeah. you and then you're out the money and there's nothing you can do about it because they live in another country. The main thing is to make sure that we talk about possible fraud, that they understand that um, that you're on top of the finances, not give them access to financial information where they could have a problem, and do your own kind of personal audit where you're just reviewing the vendors, review the pay stubs, make sure that the same person doesn't get the mail that inputs the checks that goes to the bank. If you do those things, uh, then you're going to be all right. I mean, it, those are the main ways that people get in trouble. Well, and, and it gets back to having processes in place, right? Mm -hmm. If you just rely on trust like a bit and likability, mm -hmm. I think that that's also when people get in trouble a lot because yes. there's no way to measure or, or, okay, uh, run a PNL for me right now. Let's just take a look and see yes. what's going on. Yes. And because we're like nice people, you know, we just want to, you know, help women, you guys, especially you would just want to help women invest and you want to create great housing and be good to your owners. Well, we just don't think like those people. So you really have to be aware that people, the, the biggest uh, contributors to fraud in any business are the most likable people. They are super, they, they get people to trust them and that's why uh, they're able to get away with it. So uh, anyway, the book is really good mm. and, um, and I'm glad I read it because we were just growing so fast. I was like, oh my gosh, where, where are my blind spots? And I found that book and it was really helpful. So 260 remote uh, VAs you manage for you bring in and then you employ and mm -hmm. then they help various property management companies. Yes. And all the across sizes? the U S and Canada, What's the um, size you know, property? it just, it runs the gamut from, you know, maybe there's just one person in the office and this is their first employee or large, huge organizations that manage many, many multifamily. It just really um, depends. Yeah. So, and there are lots of ways to do it. I mean, like I said before, if you don't want to manage people, because it's still managing a human being, then there are other outfits that will just outsource uh, after our, I mean, we actually do that for rent manager, but the 24 seven call center for maintenance emergencies, call overflow leasing, and then you don't have to manage people. Uh, you just have some other organization, make sure that a task is being done. Um, and so there are lots of different ways to outsource the work so that you can live the lifestyle that you really want um, and make sure that your company is running efficiently. And let me ask you a question. So I understand that a lot of the procedures are, are standards, but from your perspective as a company that is offering VA service, hiring the VAs and therefore uh, they're offering service for, for the property management companies, how customizable <laughs> can you be for each of your clients? So we just do general training uh, on the front end. So we train on um, Fair Housing and American Disabilities Act. Everyone has to 
pass those classes. And I actually outsource that to like a, a teacher teacher who teaches in the Omaha area at the local real estate school. We teach four ways people can die in property management. We talk about oh fire. Oh my gosh. I know. Fire, carbon monoxide poisoning, natural gas explosion, and a technician being mistaken for an intruder and getting shot. Mm. Um, I cover, I have high anxiety, you guys. So I'm like, <laughs> what are the things that small companies are not thinking about mm. that their employees have to know before I let them out of the door and then they can learn, you know, your FAQs, your hours of operation and exactly how you do the processes. But they also need to know um, just general, like we were talking about before, getting along. Like that fourth email that's kind of rude isn't going to change anyone's mind. Pick up the phone, you know. Um, so we talk about just getting along and um, asking, making sure they know who they report to. Uh, because a lot of times like a property management company will have one property manager and then they get a hundred units on and then they're like, you report to these property managers now, just do all their things for them. Who do they prioritize? What work it comes first? You know, who do they report to? How do they know they're doing a good job? And so kind of giving them those red flags to ask the right questions and get us involved if they need help. Um, so we talk about that. Uh, just just some of those general business things about answering the phones and just knowing what problems, um, challenges face property managers every day. So we do that training and then kind of send them on for the more specific operational things uh, at their organization that they're assigned to. You know, that's funny that you were saying about the person, the maintenance person getting shot. So actually yesterday, not that my guy got shot, but... You should we, be smart. <laughs> that didn't happen. He's he's so sweet. He he's from Mexico and he does an excellent job. So I needed a copy of 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 a, a key and I communicated through the portal with the husband and he said, "No worries. Um, my wife is working from home and he can stop by and talk to her and get a copy of the key. No problem whatsoever." Oh my gosh. Apparently he did not communicate that with the wife. So when my guy got there and he called me, he's like, she's really afraid of me. And I was like, what do you mean? She like, what, what's the point? She's like, she says she doesn't know. Why do I need a key? Who am I? Who am I? And all of that. And I was like, Oh, Oh, hold on a second. Let's take a step back. And I was like, is she there? Like put me on the phone with her. So he rang the bell and he said, I can see her, but she's not coming to open the door. I was like, okay, so don't. And then I called the husband and figured out all the miscommunication and she apologized. She didn't know about it, but that's exactly what you're saying. Oh my gosh. Yes. And with roommate situations, it, it's usually the pest control people <laughs> in multifamily that I worry about their safety all the time mm. because you send an email, you put a flyer under the door and you're like, Hey, we're coming for the building at this time. Yeah. And the roommates are like fly by night and they don't communicate. And then someone's sleeping and uh, they knock really loud, but they're just like a really heavy sleeper. And so the, we've, we've employed like text messaging as an additional um, measure to make sure people find out. But whenever you have any kind of maintenance, you, we always have our people say, and let anyone know who could possibly be in the house that we're coming at one o'clock on Tuesday. Um, so dog walker, housekeeper, yes. you know, uncle on the couch, like make yeah. a joke about it. Let everybody know we're coming because we don't want to scare anybody. Sure. Oh my gosh. That it's so simple though, but it's, it's real life. And it makes a lot of the difference because sometimes you can get emails and say, you guys did not tell me that somebody so-and-so was coming. It's okay. Uh, let's check your, your box inbox. Right. But <laughs> your text also, message, I mean, you know, for a lot single of them. women or any woman, yeah. it could literally be the scariest moment of their life. If yeah if they wake up True. and somebody's in their house. And so taking those customer service calls have to be done in like such a 
empathetic way, even 100%. if it's totally their fault, just 100%. because it's terrifying. So it is. We ended up laughing <laughs> on the phone because it was like when she opened the door, I was like, put me on the phone with her. And then she's like, oh my gosh, you guys scared the shit out of me. I was like, I'm so sorry. I should have called you directly and, and told you that. She didn't recognize him before. Mm -hmm. I think he was wearing like a, a hoodie. <laughs> or something. Oh, yeah. I think, it was um, hilarious. The, I'm sorry. Let <laughs> me interrupt you. I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jessica. Um, I think it's a, you know, interesting concept what you're doing, Gwen, because I feel like more and more, I'm hearing more and more companies doing what you're doing, right? So mm -hmm. they, they've had such great success for their own company and now they're, they're helping other companies, especially in the real estate uh, arena. It seems like it's huge. I, I, you know, it's like, it's like that thing where you, you see a white car, you never saw it before. And then like the next day, all you see is this car because your awareness is peaked. And it's the same thing with the kind of business you have. So the women listening that are considering working with a company like yours, um, you know, they have to vet them like they would vet anyone, right? And, and sure. their processes, their systems. And, and, it, and it seems like there's more and more companies. Um, what differentiates you guys from, from others? And not just that, but how does a, a woman listening that's managing her own properties, it's like, you know what? Maybe there's another way. Maybe I can hire some remote people and maybe I don't have to do it myself. Maybe I can go to a tried and true approach, which is, I think is amazing what you're offering. How do they vet, you know, these types of companies that, um, that are offering these services, finding the remote people for their own companies? I think the main thing is you just don't want to be held hostage, right? Like you don't want to get into some long-term contract, especially if you've never done it before. Like maybe you realize six months in, you know, and I'm, I'm bad at this. Like I don't, this isn't my gig or yeah. I don't have enough work for them or my business changed in some way. I lost this client. I can't afford it. Mm. Some kind of change. You just don't want to be like stuck in some long-term contract. Okay. And so our service is like, we really believe in our quality. We believe in what we do. So we don't hold people to a long-term contract. There's a contract for a year that outlines our service and what we're going to offer and what we do, what we don't do. But if you're unhappy for any reason, by all means, you know, our goal is to make you happy. So there's no, you know, we, you can stop the relationship. There's no fee to get out of it. And I just think that company, it's, it's always a little scary for me when companies uh, hold you hostage mm. for a long period of time because businesses can change or what if you're unhappy? I don't know. So that, that's, that's one thing as a small business owner with like a tight budget, which we've been in the past, that's something I look for. I also, when I do businesses with mostly software companies, I always ask if they're venture capital funded because I get a little nervous sometimes that, uh, that venture capitals are capitalists are into short term instead of long term interests, and if what their uh, philosophy is on debt, uh, and which country they're located out of. So mm -hmm. when we've we've vetted tons of software over the years, and whenever we change now that we have so many employees, whenever we make a change, it's like a huge deal because if we s phrase the email wrong, you know, we can get 260, like what, you know, emails back. So you have to, when you roll things out, it has to be extremely clear and you have to be sure that you want to make this major adjustment. And so, um, so those are the big things that I'm looking for is just making sure the stability of the company and that they're in it for the long term. And if I have a question, you know, there's somebody to answer it and uh, that they care about their clients. I think that those are the main things. And you've been able to scale multiple companies, you know, and you started with a du uh, not a duplex. Um, you started with uh, the 11 unit. And now you're, unit. now you're, I'm sure, have various rentals, multiple businesses. What have you had to do, you know, to keep yourself growing and expanding? Because I think, you know, a lot of us are at that point where you're like, I'm doing this well. I'm, you know, I'm feeling a little nervous about this because I'm moving into a new area. Clearly, I mean, you hired remote people, which is huge. And then you actually are doing that now for multiple companies at a level of, you know, almost a few hundred people. So, and the remote. So, I'm, you know, some of us are struggling. I don't want to hire one person remote, let alone three, almost 300. So what have you had to do over the years? You know, I'm curious about that, like your own development, your own kind of navigating all of this, you know, do you, are you part of some sort of, you know, group or coach or like, what has been some of your 
success trait like traits like i've had to do these things to keep me moving and growing as a leader and as a president of a company multiple companies well yeah i mean i had i've had major imposter syndrome for like a long time so the big thing when we started growing at a because we have the processes and procedures the companies that we've grown recently have grown very quickly um and but then when you see the growth, you, you're like, wait, it's just me. Oh my God. Like these people work for me. Like, I, I, do they know me? Like, I, am I ready for this? So I basically called it the poor man's MBA. And I think I read about 30 books on business this summer. And I just would do it on audible. I'd read it while I was doing my hair, doing my makeup, mm -hmm. doing anything around the house. I would just like listen to books. And then I took leaders out in my local area uh, I networked heavily and anyone that I thought was successful, I took them out to lunch uh, and I asked them, you know, cause things do break when you get above 250 is like kind of that magic number I've heard like 250 employees, everything's going to break. Like all your systems will break cause you mm. don't know who anyone is anymore. And mm. so you have to have like amazing systems and we did have, and some of the softwares don't support large numbers of people. So you mm. have a great relationship with a software provider and then you get big enough and everything starts glitching out. So it was just, it, it's been a wild ride, but asking people in other industries how to make things work. Um, and I got some amazing responses. Like one guy said, you're from small business world. So you need to divide up your business like it's small businesses because you thrive in chaos. If you were a corporate person, I would say make it like really hierarchical. Right. And that was like fantastic advice. Right? That is great so, advice. So taking those people out has been a big thing. Um, and uh, just, just having hmm. a really great support system. The other thing I True. will say for women, um, we invest in this culture index. It's a personality survey. And mm -hmm. one of the cool things about it is it has an energy units component to it. You only have so much energy in a day. And we as women think that we can, you know, uh, work. 80 hours a week, take care of the kids, clean the house, go grocery shopping, do all the things. Yeah. And I did end up outsourcing most of my domestic work. I did it before my company was making money, like, you know, money. Mm. And so I invested in that so I could put the time in later. And then when I'm hanging out with my kids, I'm focused on them. I have a 10 and a 13 year old or almost 13, a 10 and a 12 year old right now. But uh, I'm just focused on them. We're having quality time together and I'm not spending that time folding laundry. So I did do that and I feel guilty about it, but it's, it's, do it I, could anyway. never, I could have never grown or done what we've uh, built the company to do had I been, you know, doing all the domestic tasks as well. Cause you only have so much energy. So what are you going to put it towards? is is a big question people have to ask and you have to make choices in order to do it mm, sure it's really powerful it'd be cool to see your your poor man's mba list you know that'd be cool to share in our i would love to share it yeah i mean yeah. Some, I have some uh i would be happy to share the the list though i have some on audible some that's neat actual books but yeah it was a, a huge thing the other thing that i've gained a lot from is the harvard business review I'm a big advocate of that publication. Read it front to back every time it comes out. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. So many good, it comes with so much good insight into that. I love, I love thinking about when you have a lot of aspects of the business that you're trying to manage or figure out, thinking about them as small businesses. I think that's really a great insight because then you start to get into like this. I know that's where, where, where we are in some of the areas of our businesses. You know, you start to be like, because you can go down the corporate route. And that can yeah. be very overwhelming. And you're, you're, that's what you're trying to go against, right? That's why you left corporate. Right. That's why we all leave corporate, right? We don't want to create another corporate company. But that could happen. And I've seen that happen with people who leave corporate and they, they work with you. And to keep it all kind of small little businesses, I think, is actually really a great idea. And it's a way to like manage the, the chaos. So that's a good tip. Um, selfishly, that's a great tip. So I'm like, it's all about me and what I can get from the interview. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Um, Gwen, um, where can the ladies listening, uh, learn more about you and, and the company that you are running so successfully and what you're, what you're doing these days? 
Well, I'm on Facebook and I love to meet other investors there at Gwen, G-W-E-N-N-W Aspen. Um, but I also have a website, Aniquim, A-N-E-Q-U-I-M.net. And I just love supporting women. And so anything that we can do to be helpful, um, you know, we'd love to answer questions, help people out. Awesome. That's awesome. And all this information you guys can find on our show notes. Now we're going to transition to our fabulous three questions. And the first one, Gwen, is what's the most transformational book you have ever read? Mm, transformational book I have ever read. Well, I would say uh, because of the time I found it in my life, it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But I would also say there was one book that I read that at the same time um, called Spent Sex Evolution and Consumer Behavior. Mm -hmm. And the reason I liked that book was because um, it, it made me not want to show off any kind of money and focus on investing first before, you know, trying to prove to people I was, you know, worthwhile. So we live so humbly and that book gave us confidence to do so, which allowed us to build our, our nest egg. So awesome. those two books together um, formulated our path moving forward. That's great. And the second question is, what's the most powerful routine that you do to create a financially free and balanced life? Routine? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I would say that the meeting structure that we have created to hold people accountable, um, it's, it's EOS. It's nothing crazy. Traction is the book. I read the book years ago. I never even had one of those consultants or anything. We just read the book and started doing it. That created a environment where we had the accountability and we really felt like we were moving our businesses forward. And so I would say that that book and that accountability, uh, that cadence of accountability is what kind of transformed us uh, uh, and our businesses. That's awesome. And the last question is, which women, famous or not, has inspired you the most? Mm. There are so many amazing women out there. It's so hard to say. You know, Brene Brown... Uh, her vulnerability uh, speech on TED Talk uh, and uh, the other one I think is on shame were so influential at a really uh, difficult time in my life. So I would say that she has had a tremendous influence and I'm so impressed by her. And she's so funny too. She <laughs> is. She uh, is. We need to have her on our show. Uh, she, she's like one of our top people where we got to get on our show. Um, well, thank you so much, Gwen. You've been uh, so amazing here. Appreciate your time. Appreciate all your great nuggets. Um, I took a ton of notes. So I just, you know, appreciate being here with us and sharing your great knowledge with all the women listening. Oh my gosh. It's so my pleasure. I'm very grateful to be here. And um, it's exciting to be with a bunch of amazing women, inspiring other women to see the best in themselves. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Gwen. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.